I'm Dan Liu, and I'm the CEO of the Computer History Museum, here to introduce our next session, Earthly Technologies and Martian Stories, Combining the Fidgetal and Digital to Create a New Perspective. Um, welcome to the program. Uh, for those in the audience, please um, don't forget to type your questions into the Q&A box at any point throughout the session so we can be prepared to carry on a conversation after this wonderful presentation that's upcoming by Marcus Harshaw, who's from the Carnegie Science Center. Um, so let me hand it over to you, Marcus, and let you kick off the program. Thanks so much. Thank you, and welcome everybody again to Marthly Technologies and or Earthly Technologies and Martian Stories. Um, my name is Marcus Harshaw, and I'm the Senior Director for Museum Experiences here at Carnegie Science Center, which generally means I oversee all the fun stuff. So all of our exhibitions and our theaters. Um, I also We also have a, a Cold War era submarine um, and a 102 year old miniature railroad and village. Um, Carnegie Science Center is located here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we are one of four Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. Um, we've been here as the Science Center uh, has been here for a little over 30 years now. And so I'm going to talk to you today, yes, about some great technologies, but in sort of the guise of these Martian stories. Um, the image you're seeing here is an image of a gallery from a new permanent exhibition that we just opened um, about 80, a little over 81 days ago, um, right in, in the middle of November, entitled Mars, the Next Giant Leap. Um, this exhibition tells the story of the space industry here in Pittsburgh, um, in seven galleries, totaling 7,400 square feet. And this exhibition replaced a fan favorite robotics exhibition that was in the same gallery, had occupied that same gallery for over 13 years. Um, this, the design work for this exhibition um, from concept development all the way to the November public open took us about 20 months. Um, it started right uh, shortly after the uh, pandemic. So quite a quite a very quick uh, 20 months process it was. Um, and again, it focuses more on the human experience of going to Mars. Um, this is not a Mars 101 exhibition. So we're not going to talk about, I mean, you will find throughout some things about Martian gravity or how far it is from the sun, but we really wanted to focus on the human experience of going to Mars. Um, and again, the burgeoning space industry here in Pittsburgh and the fact that space industry careers are not limited to rocket science, ro rocket scientists. Um, and so we had a lot of sort of stories we wanted to tell about Mars. Um, and so we were able to do that in this exhibition. But as you can imagine, space is a vast topic. When we brought that topic down to just Mars, I mean, even going to Mars is a vast topic. And there are so many different stories in rich uh, science that is happening, currently happening um, on the red planet or and about the red planet that we wanted to highlight. But there's only limited square footage. There's only limited resources to make some, to make that happen. And so as we set out on this exhibition prog uh, process, um, we were fortunate to be connected to Richard Lewis Media Group uh, out of Boston, Massachusetts, to help translate some of these great stories that we wanted to tell into the digital perspective. And through that, technology created a better human-centered experience for Mars, the next giant leap. While a lot of the technologies that I'll talk about that we use in this exhibition aren't particularly new, 
they are new to CSC. While they may not be particularly new, they were new to our audiences. And what it, one of the things that is important to think about is thinking about how new things that are new to your audiences um, are more helpful in taking a museum experience to that next level. So uh, here you have the before and after. So before you can see the former robotics gallery um, on the left photo of the screen, you can see it was very bright, very open, lots of uh, things to do, a lot of robotic technology, but, um, and again, it was a fan favorite. And so we, there was a lot of challenge between removing a exhibition that had, again, been around for 13 years um, but we knew that as long as we provided our guests something better than they had, um, that they would be okay with that. And you see the uh, one of the sky shots of Mars, the next giant leap on the right. Technology played a crucial role in creating a more immersive experience in this space. I mean, you can already start to see those differences from the left, which is a very white and bright and very open space. Whereas Mars is a little darker, a little, really, really we wanted to put our guests in the mindset of what it would be like to travel to Mars. Um, we were able to use narrative to really, again, tell a story and get people to uh, feel that they were part of the story of going to Mars. And what we also did here is we did not just use technology for technology's sake. We used technology to create immersive experiences again and um, provide other avenues to tell some more complex stories. The challenge that we faced with the robotics gallery uh, on the left is that while robotics technology was changing all the time, um, the, the gallery itself was not designed to be changing all the time. And so when we changed and we were designing Mars, we knew we had an opportunity to sort of shift that mindset and design and build an exhibition that uh, allowed us to make some quick kind of updates um, as obviously science and what we've learned and what we know about Mars is changing on a very regular basis. And so we needed to make sure that we had an exhibit that reflected um, that rapidly changing uh, science. What we learn is, Science does not occur in a vacuum. And so science is informs and is informed by the arts, humanities, literature, culture, foodways, you name it. And at the same time, we wanted to illustrate that science changes and build the exhibition again to allow for quick content updates and introduce complex topics. For instance, the Meals on Mars touchscreen interactive. Again, a lot of your a lot of museums have touchscreens. Ours didn't have many touchscreens, if at all. And so this one um, was really effective to again tell a story in a way that having a more physical uh, hands-on interactive would have been really difficult um, and less effective to do. So this interactive asks guests to think like a chef. They get to create a Martian meal with various um, toppings or various uh, sort of uh, ingredients. Um, for a meal that, you know, you may know today. So we have tikka marsala, we have uh, chocolate cake, pot stickers, macaroni and cheese. Asking our guests to think how they would 
create those same recipes that we enjoy so much on Earth on Mars. When it takes six months and millions and millions and billions of dollars for a, a grocery run, right, to your nearest uh, grocery store. Um, and thinking about what are the types of foods that we could possibly grow on Mars and how would those affect um, how we can uh, how we can create recipes on the Martian surface. So this interactive, again, goes you go through the uh, this interactive by selecting these different ingredients. And at the end, it says, congratulations, you created a meal that is uh, extremely efficient and extremely sustainable for someone living on a Martian settlement. Or um, if you've chosen some ingredients that maybe they we've had to ship all those ingredients from, from Earth to make a chocolate cake. Or um, then it would tell you that maybe your uh, recipe wasn't as sustainable. Um, and so what you have here, again, are the complex story around foodways. How are people using food? How would you think about food on the Martian surface? Um, we get, again, we get to talk about sustainability. We get to talk about um, actually growing me, uh, plants and things on Mars to help sustain our bodies. Um, we get to tell the story about how long it takes to get things shipped from the earth. Um, and we did to talk about resource use, right? So if we're growing things, on Mars, we have to have some water resources to do that. And with scarce water resources on a fictitious colony on Mars or a fictitious settlement on Mars, um, we have to really think about that what that resource uh, use looks like. So this touchscreen interactive takes all of that complexity and it really drills it into something that's interactive and it's fun. I was just on the exhibit floor today and saw a multi-generational family of four huddled around this, uh, this interactive, talking and having conversations and putting a meal together and learning about sustainability and thinking about what are the kinds of things that they would uh, like to make on Mars at the same time, what are the kinds of foods that maybe they would miss from home? This touchscreen allows us to do that. Another way we were able to uh, combine uh, your use of digital interactivity um, to create some perspectives is our, uh, our civic duty here. So what you're looking at is an image of the Martian uh, Dream Big Space, which is a miniature model Mars settlement. Okay, and in this settlement, the, what we have envisioned is if people were uh, living on Mars and they started this small settlement, after a while, when you have more people living, you have more pe people living and working uh, on Mars and playing on Mars. After a while, uh, you're going to need to think about your civic duty. What are the kinds of laws? What are the kinds of um, the kinds of education? The kinds of uh, economy as it starts to grow into its own uh, its own thing, right? And so, what we've done uh, again with this touchscreen interactive that you kind of see in the uh, bottom, uh, you know, almost half of the photo is we engage our guests to think about some really tough topics that a this fictitious Martian settlement um, would have to answer and have to think about. So the one you're seeing here is about energy. Um, so the story is that energy use in the settlement is heading towards its peak. And before, you know, before it does that, we have to really start thinking about adding some capacity you know, to the, to the power grid. And so how do we do that? And we have three options. After you go through this, the touch screen, it actually flushes out that story. Um, and it gives you, presents you with three options. A, should we invest in nuclear power? B, should we invest in wind power? 
or should we invest in geothermal power? And throughout in this uh, touchscreen interactive, the pros and cons are being weighed through each of these power uh, these power sources. So by time guests get to a point, get to this point where they're actually doing the voting, they have a pretty good idea of the pros and cons. Like, yes, nuclear power is efficient and very clean energy. But on Mars, there's not a lot of places that, you know, or is it ethically fair to have all this nuclear waste that we have to put somewhere? Um, and on a Martian settlement, we'll probably have to live pretty close to where that nuclear waste, uh, that nuclear waste is. Or is it wind power? And Mars can be a pretty windy place. Um, so maybe wind power is the way to go. But what are some of the drawbacks to, to that as well? And then geothermal, um, you know, con construction of the settlement um, with geothermal energy has its own level of pros and cons. At the end of the voting period, so this voting period will go through the month of uh, March. Um, at the end of the voting period, all of the um, the votes will be tallied up between the three power sources, and we will physically place a new model on the settlement to reflect the votes of all of the guests that have come into the to see the exhibition um, and participate in in this vote. But again, we wanted something that we could change regularly and something that could add some some you know make the exhibition more dynamic. So after the um, energy vote, you know, we're able to change this whole entire story out and tell a story about um, uh, recreation on Mars. Uh, we can tell a story about education on Mars. So are do we expect? The, the people in the settlement would vote for a one new large school because the population of children has increased on the settlement. So is it one large school that services all students? Is it several schools throughout the settlement that over time, those, those schools, some may have more resources than another and become more of a socioeconomic uh, challenge? Um, you know, to being able to be responsive and have stories about uh, policing, um, healthcare, or other topics that um, in our focus groups early in the uh, exhibition design process, um, we had realized were very important topics uh, to our to our to our guests. But we also have some fidgetal items. So this is these these wonderful drawers. That you that guests physically open to hear these stories from our again we've made up some folks that live in a Mars research base, and they tell their stories about their lives and how they made it to to Mars or how they became scientists or different things, and you know, digital or again it's those things that there is a physical component you have to actually open the drawer to access the digital component or to, to engage the digital component. And luckily I'm not a betting man. So here's a closer of the drawer and you see each of the drawers actually has a QR code. Um, before 2020, I put QR codes on the uh, chopping block, but that's the one thing that pandemic has resuscitated in a big way, um, but they're great for improved accessibility. So if people don't want to interact with the drawer or they have a hearing impairment, um, they can use uh, their own mobile device, scan the QR code and read audio transcripts. And that's one of the larger kind of things that we are excited, at least here at Carnegie Science Center, as we think about how, um, how digital uh, engagement will actually help um, advance our um, sort of our goals around more universal accessibility. And yes, QR codes are not going away anytime soon. Again, lucky I'm not a betting man, I've lost a whole lot of money.
But in the early part of the exhibition or towards the front of the exhibition, you have this large sort of like 14 foot high projection um, that I'm absolutely in love with. And what this piece does actually talks about sort of what we thought we knew about Mars from hundreds of years ago, that Mars had um, these this flowing water and had uh, had canyons. And there was there's actually one image in this piece where this, this is a video loop that's on this wall. And one image has like um, Venetian gondoliers rolling down a canal. And, and then it, sh it sort of shows what we've learned since that point, since these, again, as we've kind of looked at how do we tell that story and how do we use these digital means to tell a story where this is what literature and art portrayed Mars as over the years. And this is what we know from science now, right? Um, so, but it's large and immersive scale things like this piece that really help make budget dollars more effective. Um, the original sort of envisioned how this gallery was, was actually a lot of different um, hands-on interactive pieces um, that were very different. And we looked at it and this actually made more budget sense um, for us. And so, you know, to make a, make the move to a more digital direction um, took a lot of leadership buy-in. So, you know, it was up to me and my team to make sure that we were uh, that we were talking with the, this with our leadership and getting really getting ex some excitement built around this from our internal and our external stakeholders. Um, this piece, again, really enhances the story. And because of just a sheer scale at over 12 feet, it really augments the space. And the last thing I would say, because I want to make sure I leave some, some time for questions, is that Again, I, I mentioned early in this is that I know touch screens are like, wow, big deal, but I'm telling you, um, everyone's digital journey is different. And sometimes you we have all have to start somewhere. Um, and for us, it was what we've done here at Mars. And, but for you, it might be even something way more, way more cool. Um, you know, I mean, some people are probably using, what is it, chat? chat GTP or CPI or whatever. Um, but everybody's digital, digital journey is different. And so with that, I wanna make sure I leave some room for some questions, if any questions have rolled in in the... Great, well, thank you, Marcus. Thanks very, very much. I found it fascinating just to listen to you kind of walk through the relevance uh, and the science issues that are today's problems um, that motivate people, yet the whole mystery of Mars, even today with all of the, the hype and the talk that's in the air for, you know, people, uh, I think in the popular press, obviously you've got this whole story of SpaceX and, and frankly, Elon Musk and going to Mars and all that kind of stuff. So it is, it is, there's a myth and there's a reality. And then there are today's problems. And you did a really nice job of explaining and organizing that in your, in your update. So thank you for that. One of the questions that came in was related to, you know, any of the, the, um, the challenges associated with framing this into a permanent exhibit combined with the how do you keep it fresh? And, and and I like the idea of this audience engagement to gather the data to make the transitions. But what are, what are the challenges uh, around that? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a great question. And a lot of the biggest challenge, of course, is resource, um, you know, to keep things fresh, whether we are um, working with, you know, a Richard Lewis media group type of company to really help us or whether we... Um, you know, how we work in the community to understand um, how the priorities change and how priorities have shifted. Mm -hmm. So it's really just, it's really a lot of the, how we allocate the resources, the resources to do that. Um, yeah. One of the things that I have been, I wish I would have done is I wish I would have built more resource into the original project budget 
for more of that sort of long range kind of change. Um, in, 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 instead of kind of looking for it on an annual basis, like yeah, I'm doing yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. There's another question that just came in. You referenced accessibility, and I know that's a challenge for all. And with technology, there's a way to overcome those barriers, but also it's, it is a challenge to think through how you do it. Um, you know, what other thoughts do you have about that? There's, a, again, another reference on this front about the QR codes. Um, are, are they being used in other ways on the grounds at, at, at the Carnegie Science Center? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think the QR codes in the Mars exhibition was kind of the, the gateway, the gateway QR code, um, because it kind of basically the pandemic and this, this opening kind of leapfrogged um, how the Carnegie Science Center thinks about technology. And so now after seeing it in Mars, more of our collections and our marketing and our visitor uh, sort of services folks are like, you know, we can see QR codes working in these other, you know, areas um, of our business. We actually have launched some QR codes that um, for our, so we have a, a Cold War era submarine that we also uh, own and operate. And so when it's cold out or when it's raining or the weather is bad, you can't go out and do tours on the sub. And so we have a QR code that helps that um, helps kind of highlight some of the um, some of the information about the sub. So we're using mm -hmm. one there, and we have a couple of other um, options or areas where we've decided to to move in that direction. But again, it's what what I think about from an accessibility standpoint, particularly is like I said about just sort of digital things. Totally, like you, we've just got to start somewhere. Um, and it's not going to be all perfect for the entire Science Center campus. I mean, we have 11 acres here, so it's not going to be all perfect at at the, at once, um, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. Have you been tracking the QR code use? That's another question. I think that's, uh, I have the same one on my own mind, but it's coming in from the audience, the number of people piling onto that. This probably... The last question, maybe, maybe there's room for one more after this, but how you've been tracking it and do you have a, a you know, a use case or a ratio of, you know, visitors to, to inquiries, those kinds of things? How do you think about it? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I know we are tracking that, that all that code usage. I have not seen the data yet. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So the, the ones in the exhibit, like I said, have been, have only been out for not even 90 days. And then mm -hmm. like the ones for the sub, it's, I mean, they're, they're all pretty, pretty much new. So, mm -hmm. but yes, we are tracking that stuff. Yeah. I found, you know, we're all of us as we've waded through the pandemic, find that in, you know, personal outings, whether it's for food service and things like that, people sort of removing yeah. paper, but, but opening up new ways to, uh, to have that, the customer and the, the, the visitor experience is, is amazing. And the accessibility question, I think, that you pointed out is really important. Are there any other things unique in the Pittsburgh landscape, um, you know, that that caused you to think this through as you think about your local audience? Yeah. So again, I think the unique piece to this was that what I did not know, um, being new to Pitt, newer to Pittsburgh, I've been here since July of 2020. Okay. Is that there is this major science or space industry here? Mm -hmm. And there is a, it, it's it long gone are the days where it's like this gritty industrial coal town. It's yeah. really this, this clean high tech. Um, mm -hmm. We have Google here. We have a, a major Google office here. We have um, Astrobotic, which is a, which has a moon lander that they're uh, working on with NASA right now. That's just a couple of blocks up the street from us. And there's all these things that are coming together on this kind of high tech area here in Pittsburgh that have really helped inform um, and partner with this exhibition. One of the, the challenges I'd expected to have with this exhibition was, I mean, was frankly fundraising um, in, you know, we were doing the bulk of the fundraising in 2021. So we're on right. the heels of the pandemic, but we hit, we struck a, really positive nerve 
with the partners around the community and we we fundraise the entire exhibition pretty quickly. Yeah, good for you. I do know from my personal experience in the tech industry sector, you know, Carnegie Mellon among others, but CMU in particular, yeah. The, if you will, I'll, I'll use the word appropriately, I hope, you know, the godfather of the robotics industry yeah. is, is Raj Reddy from Carnegie Mellon, and he trained just about everyone in the in the business yeah. on both physical robots as well as software robots, because they're all automated tools to be put to use by, by humans, right, ideally. Um, right. And um, you do have a rich yeah. community that has made a major transition, yeah. Yeah, that robot right there is is a Carnegie Mellon robot. Sure. <laughs> so yeah. right outside my office. So yeah, and I think that may be a message for everyone who's you know involved in this in this session to to think about you know your local environment and you know mm -hmm. it's it is always surprising when you lift lift up the covers and you look locally and you realize the the local entrepreneurship and the and the local talent that's available in the university and other communities. So. Um, good for you for um, what you've done, and we all certainly appreciate the update. It's a fascinating topic to be thinking about digital uh, and then using Mars Mars as a construct for educating the audience on important topics of the day. Uh, because as we all know, and, and, and this is my personal comment, you know, when you think about we all live in past tense because everything that we experience is a is a fraction of a second old <laughs> since it comes right. in through our eyeballs. Uh, so, you know, museums by default are all history museums. They're all about the present experience, having a conversation with something that existed. And uh, you did a really nice job of explaining how you've attacked that problem. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We're, great. We're happy to wrap up this session. Um, and uh, I'd like to, to take a moment to, to close on the program. Um, it was my pleasure to be um, helping host this technology track. And, you know, I'd like to thank all of the audience members for attending the Dam and Museums Technology for Museums 2023 conference. Um, just a reminder for everyone, this session, as well as all of the sessions from today's events, uh, have been recorded are, and are accessible uh, via the agenda tab in your uh, login uh, screen and capability in the platform. Um, it's not too late uh, to catch up on uh, all of the activities that the event sponsors by which this program was presented. In the exhibition tab, you can take a look at questions and things that those sponsors, they all have a vested interest in this community. Uh, and uh, and having this community uh, be successful, I think um, you know there are more and more uh, people appreciating uh, the relevance of cultural institutions as a way to bring people together uh, as a place uh, you know uh, for sharing and uh, and obviously in today's world, um, accessibility, uh, technology, and all of those things rolled into one are are pretty fundamental. Um, on behalf of the organization, I want to mention that um, there will be an upcoming DAM event. There's one being hosted in Los Angeles on March 24th to 26th, and also in London in, this coming June and in New York City uh, this coming September. And hopefully many of you will be able to attend or log in. You go to the www.henrystewartconferences.com website to find out about all that and the information. And of course, they always offer um, exceptional discounts for those that register early. So um, I'm enthusiastic about what I've learned today. Um, it really was very interesting to look at the different problems, how people are approaching them. Uh, the approaches uh, in, in, in this fast moving technology world. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see the use cases and the, and the technology uh, applications um, that, that are being considered, experimented, shared. Uh, that's the other thing that I think is nice about this uh, conference is the fact that people are sharing and making things available in an open way. Um, Personally, for me, coming to this conference, uh, this is the first time I've, I've dedicated a day uh, and um, really appreciate, uh, again, both the sophistication with which people are thinking about the problems, but also the attack uh, that they've taken at solving them. Some cases, they're little experiments and one-off things that show what's possible. 
in other areas I've seen, uh, and I, I think witnessed today, um, living, breathing, interactive opportunities to live and learn uh, about how um, you know you can take audience input and then modify and also extend the experience um, so that they are more and more relevant um, to motivate audiences to return and come back and, and experience um, new things that will will again spark their curiosity uh, and and learning. Um, I know for many people, um, it's these early experiences as as a youth, if you will, where you visit a museum or a cultural institution of any kind um, that motivates you know your life's work and your life path. So uh, again, thanks everyone for what you've done here uh, in this program and in this track. Uh, and um, we'll carry on and hopefully see you at the next program. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Marcus, again. And I'll be signing off uh, for the conference today. All right, cheers and thank you. Great.